Welcome to the 51st pre de west Invitational Art Exhibition and Sale. Here to begin today's program is the Curator of Ethnology for the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum, Dr. Eric Singleton. Um, good morning and thank you for joining us for our second day of seminars. I'd like to thank our sponsors listed on the screen. The museum is able to provide quality education and experiences because of these organizations and individuals. We appreciate Panera Bread for providing our refreshments. We also thank our seminar sponsor, Wendy and Stephen Olshan. Folks, if you see someone wearing a sponsor ribbon, please be sure to thank them for their contributions to Prita West. Later today at 1 p.m., please join artists Scott Christensen and Sherry McGraw at the artist demonstrations located in the boardroom and classroom. Also, those interested in taking home a memento from the opening weekend, please visit our newly renovated Persimmon Hill store located near the front entry. There you will find commemorative pre west bolos and catalogs. And while you're there, check out the trunk shows. The store will remain open until 8 o'clock this evening. We have another outstanding presentation this morning, followed by the highly anticipated pre to west Purchase Award announcement at noon. We invite you to stay with us for these presentations of this award directly following our lunch break. And now for our morning speaker. Our artist grew up in South Texas and under the guidance of his father, began developing his artistic skills at a young age. Raised around horses in the Gulf Coast, he grew to appreciate the beauty and heritage of his Texas surroundings. He worked closely with his grandfathers, both skilled carpenters, and learned the reward of creating with one's hands. He began his formal training in fine art at the Victoria College in Victoria, Texas, with an emphasis in oil painting and participated in instructional sessions under uh, Dalhart Winberg, whose work influenced him since boyhood. His numerous awards include the 2013 Express Ranch's Great American Cowboy Award and the 2022 Pre to West Purchase Award. Please welcome artist Kyle Polson. Hi guys, um, I'm Kyle Polson. Um, uh, let's see. Um, so it's such an honor to be up here on the stage after winning the uh, Purchase Award last year. And uh, honestly, that that winning that award has been the uh, highlighted my whole painting career. So, um, and, after, and honestly, after, after receiving the award and the smoke had cleared, and, um, but it was still sinking in that I had uh, won the award, um, Susan Patterson um, approached me out in the hallway and was like, congratulations, Kyle. And she said, um, uh, you know, every year after the, or the following year, we like to ask the artist to come and give a talk. And, and, um, but the good news is you have all year to prepare for your talk. And I thought, <laughs> I, so I thought, oh boy, man, I'm going to have to, I was thinking, um, this is not my comfort zone. So honestly, for exactly one year, because I think it was this time last year, I, won the, I was presented the award. So for exactly one year, I've been uh, kind of worried about this moment. So uh, bear with me. I, I, I'm going to try to let my, just shake my nerves off a little bit, and hopefully I don't stumble, stumble through too much. But I thought um, that uh, today um, it might be interesting to kind of, rather than talking about my technique, um, I thought I'd talk more about how an idea evolves from, um, from going from an idea to then winding up on canvas as a, as a uh, completed painting. And then afterwards, I figured once I was through talking, if you guys want to ask me more technique questions, um, y'all feel free to ask what you want. But um, so um, a lot of times, um, uh, so basically for the bulk of my career, I've been a still life painter. And, um, and I try really hard to bring a, um, to bring a story into each one of my paintings. And then sometimes it's kind of hard, especially if I'm doing a, well, I've realized that cowboy subject matter lends itself really well to storytelling. But then there's times when I might paint a floral scene, which is a little harder to tell a story. So I'll maybe put the flowers in like an old mason jar, which kind of adds a little um, time and space to the piece and maybe puts a clue in there of, of where, maybe it's on an old, um, like in an old farmhouse or something. And then maybe through the lighting in the painting, the color and the texture, maybe the light spilling in from a window on the side. And uh, so it kind of lets the viewer put that story together in their own mind. And I think it's cool when you can cast a shadow into the um, painting from outside the frame, and it almost opens up a whole other dimension where you kind of think, well, maybe what's going on outside, the, uh, outside of the scene? So all that stuff kind of comes together as a narrative in the painting. 
But, um, but going back to the story, um, I find uh, a lot of times I've got to, I'll have an item that I've collected, but I don't have the story yet. And then there's times when I've got the story, but I don't have the item. So I've got to either hunt the item down or maybe a group of items or maybe even have to make something to go into the painting. And so a perfect example of that was my painting that I did last year, um, Rough Passage, which was the stagecoach painting. And so I really wanted to tell a stagecoach story here. And um, you can imagine this is all, the, this, this, uh, this is the final result, but all this um, is going together in my imagination. So I wanted to tell the stagecoach painting, or uh, tell the stagecoach story. So I, I thought, um, well, I can imagine this old stage um, pulling into its destination. It's getting late. The, the passengers are all um, off the stage, but maybe the, the shotgun carrier has already hopped off and he left his, his shotgun sitting there. And um, all these ideas are coming to mind. I'm thinking about the, the different pieces that might be lashed down to the top of the stage. And then um, maybe even the, the tarp, I could see it kind of maybe blown back after a dusty day of traveling, you know. So um, all, these, all these ideas are coming together. And then I thought, okay, well, I need to start um, hunting down the objects. So that's always really fun for me. So first I found this old shotgun that had the hammers on it. It was, it was a, a perfect shotgun to make an old coach gun, um, era correct, you know. And then I found an old hat box that I thought was cool. And I definitely needed the, the Wells Fargo strong box. I mean, that's pretty iconic for the, for the Overland stage. And so um, all these pieces are coming together and I'm getting excited. And then I'm thinking, okay, the one thing I don't have is a stagecoach. And so, <laughs> and I, I, I knew there's a stagecoach here, you know, and I'm thinking of the possibilities, but I'm like, I can't, it's not, it's not realistic to, to uh, bring that into my studio. So I thought, I think I got to build a stagecoach. And not a whole stagecoach, but I just needed something that was going to be what was going to fit into my vision for the painting. So I start researching stages and um, looking at how they're built, which this is all, this is where I love my, what I do. So I'm starting to investigate all this stuff and looking at how the, the roof rack is put together. And, and so I start building all the, the, the top half of the stagecoach and I'm, I'm painting it and I, I, I uh, stitched together the curtains and figured out how they were fastened on and all that stuff. And so as it's coming together, um, here's the, the facade, you know, and that's part of it. And then the next part of it here, I'm starting to put this together. And this is all going to go together as the, um, for what I could vision for the painting. And then when it was all set up in my studio, I had it all kind of composed like that. And so um, that, that part, and I mean, once I get to that part, that's super exciting. But now I've got to paint it, you know. But, um, but just to get to that place feels like such a creative, um, I mean, it's so much fun, but once you finally get a composition and you have that, that vision you had in your mind down and, and it's tangible and it's starting to come together, that's, uh, that's the fun part for me. So, um, and then um, going on, the, uh, let's see, the next, um, so this, the painting to th um, this year, my uh, Ballad of a Cowboy, was kind of the opposite. I had the, the, the item, but I didn't have the story. And so I had this old German-made violin that I'd, been, that I'd had, had so much character. And I thought, um, let's see, I, um, so here's the violin here. I had this, and I'd been wanting, just waiting for the perfect opportunity to, to paint it, but I just wasn't sure about the story. And so my wife, Lee, and I were in San Antonio, and we were visiting the McNay Museum. And there was, a, um, there was a, uh, a, um, an exhibit on an old cowboy by the name of Ricardo Beasley. And he... He was a cowboy artist, and, and they had some of his old tally books and things from, from working cattle, and he would reach in his pocket, and he'd do some little sketches of some old Broncos or just little things that, that were happening in his life, you know, just maybe a scene of some guys branding a, branding a steer or something. And so I started thinking, oh, that's cool, because that was kind of his downtime, you know, and he wasn't out working cattle. He's just doodling and sketching, and I thought that might be a neat spin to do a painting of... Um, kind of the cowboy downtime. So uh, you'll probably see that next year. I got to let that idea stew a little bit. But then after leaving that, um, the museum, I, uh, I started thinking, how could I apply that to the, the violin that I have? And I thought, you know, the cowboy's life is um, grueling and hard work. And you know, you're out, out on the prairie and you're, you know, um, you're fighting off the sticker burrs and trying to keep the snakes out of your sleeping bag. And the, uh, the, 
um, sorry. Um, yeah, so, yeah, so anyway, I'm thinking, you know, what is it that they, that they did, you know, once they all got back to the chuck wagon and um, everybody's kind of sitting around, I'm thinking, oh, the, you know, the fiddle comes out, they're all singing, they're all, they're all uh, just enjoying themselves and sitting around the chuck wagon and, um, you know, they break the fiddle out. So that idea starts coming together, and um, then I, uh, so, so the next thing I start thinking about is, okay, I've got this old fiddle, and, um, but the thing is, I want to I wanna be, um, be able to make sure it's correct for the painting. And so I reached out to a friend of mine named Ross Holmes, who's a professional fiddle player, and he, um, he's played for bands like uh, Mumford & Sons and... Um, the Nitty Gritty Dirt Band. Let's see, there's Ross in the middle there playing his fiddle. And super nice guy. And so I reached out to Ross and I sent him some pictures of my fiddle. And he, um, he said, oh man, he said, yeah, that's definitely in the, in the ballpark for the, the fiddle. The problem is it's missing some pieces. He said, it looks like it's been, um, it, the strings weren't right. It didn't have the chin rest on it at the time. And so um, he said, you know, I'll send you some pictures of some fiddles that he had that, that were kind of error correct. And it turns out that the fiddle of that era had a particular uh, style chin rest on it, and, um, and the, the strings were gut strings, you know. So I set out to try to find the, the right chin rest for it. And, and what was fun about it is I was able to go down the rabbit hole of learning about, about fiddles. And, um, and so it turns out that the, the, I couldn't get a hold of the, just the right fiddle, uh, the, neck, the chin rest that I needed. So I found something close and ended up carving the shape of the, the correct and the size, carving it into the shape, shape it needed to be, which is just one more aspect that was super fun for me to kind of go off on a tangent. And I sent him a picture. He said, oh, yeah, that's right. And he said, the cool thing, too, is he said a lot of times they kind of modified their chin rest anyway. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a big deal. But it, he said, it looks, it's just, you got, you got it spot on. You got the strings right, um, old gut strings on it and everything. And so, so anyway, uh, I was excited about that. And then I started having to think about, I wanted to bring the poetry element into it. And the, uh, you know, I grew up listening to old saddle songs and my grandfather would sing, um, he would sing uh, uh, Little Joe the Wrangler and uh, Strawberry Roan to me. And um, so I just had these memories of that. And, uh, and, and it, you know, a lot of times the cowboys just kind of sing from the heart about what they enjoyed most and, and the things that they saw and, and just kind of, they'd, they'd sit around. It was pretty informal. And they would, um, they might be just in the saddle just to pass the time, just kind of humming or singing along and thinking of these lyrics. And maybe they're watching the night herd, you know, and they're, they're uh, trying to calm the cattle. So they'd sing these songs. And so it wasn't really, it was just, it was pretty um, non-documented. And then here comes this cowboy, this old cowboy named Jack Thorpe. And he's one of the only guys that writes the lyrics down some, to some of these old songs, which we know today. And, uh, and, um, one of the uh, um, one of the the lyrics that caught my attention was by this guy by the name of uh, Badger Clark, and uh, let's see the uh, I thought that the the line was um, was really fitting for this painting. It kind of um, summed up the spirit. It says, "When my old soul hunts range and rest beyond the last divide, just plant me in some stretch of west that's sunny, lone, and wide." Let cattle rub my tombstone round and coyotes mourn their kin. Let horses paw and tromp the mound, but just don't fence it in. And uh, I just thought that was super cool. It just really gave the spirit of, the, of being out on the range and the, maybe the way these, these old cowboys felt. And, uh, and so Badger, he, he kind of saw himself as an individualist and, and um, was kind of a, um, he enjoyed the outdoors and, and um, being in the open range. And just that spirit that he brought to that lyric just really seemed to sum up the, what I thought about these, uh, these um, what would fit in that painting. So, um, uh, but I think a lot of us still kind of feel that way today, you know, so it, it really, we feel a, pa a, dr a real draw to the West and being out there and the, and the, and just taking it all in. But then, um, so the next, the next thing I had to think about was the photograph that, I, I'm, I put in the painting, and it, um, I really struggled with this one because I could see in the vision in my mind this, you know, all the cowboys around the campfire and the guys with the fiddle. You know, I, I really was looking for that specific photograph, and, and um, I finally found one, but it was dark, and the fiddle player could barely make him out, and it just didn't work for my composition. And then I thought, you know, maybe I'm being too literal here. And so I, uh, I started thinking about the photographs of Erwin E. Smith, who I've always been drawn to his photos. 
And um, he did a lot of these pictures from around the turn of the century of these old cowboys. And they're all, they're all doing stuff, you know. And it's just like, it, I love looking at the details in these photos. And, and um, you can pick up so many clues as to what life might have been like. And so looking at his photos, I came across this photo. And I thought, oh, that's, that's the photo. You know, it's, it's, it's so powerful because he's got this, he's contemplating, he's looking out over the herd. He's there in a quiet moment with his horse. And I can just, I can just imagine he's, you know, the, he's inspired and he just wants to, he's thinking of those Badger Clark lyrics and he just, he's about to scratch them down on, that, on the piece of paper that, that I have in my painting. You know, it's just like, there was something so, so powerful in that photo. So that's how I settled on that, um, that on that, on that picture there. And then if you notice, he's smoking a cigarette. And I thought, I thought, uh, you know, I got to include an old pack of Bull Durham because it's most likely Bull Durham that he was smoking. And so, and my grandfather was a tobacco salesman. So there's a little bit of a, uh, you know, so that there's something there that I think is kind of cool. But anyway, I, I, so I, and I thought, you know, Bull Durham's definitely a part of cowboy downtime. And I thought about whiskey, but I couldn't fit it in there. I just didn't, couldn't fit a whiskey bottle in my painting. But anyway, uh, let's see, here's the, here's the, uh, here's the and, and the thing I like so much about those old, I like old whiskey labels and old um, tobacco labels like that. And the, especially the old revenue stamps, they, they kind of look like money and they just have such a neat texture. It's a real challenge to try to paint. And they always kind of add a little element to my painting. So I try to fit that kind of stuff in where, wherever I can. And this one really, uh, it really worked out well to put that in there. And then lastly, I had every cowboy needs a set of spurs, you know. So I had to round out the composition with a set of spurs in there. And, uh, and so, um, but, I, but I think, and I put them in there kind of as an iconic nod to cow, the cowboy way of life, you know. But then the, um, the, the thing about it is this painting, when it all was done, just has every texture that I like to paint in it. It's got the old wood. It's got the, uh, the, the old metal um, of the spurs with the patina on it and the photographs and the crumbled up paper and then the tobacco label. It just kind of has all the pieces that, that, uh, that I enjoy painting. But um, after saying all that, I think it'd be irresponsible for me not to say that I was highly inspired by the painting of William Harnett's called The Old Violin, and it hangs in the National Museum or the National Gallery in Washington, D.C. But I think so many artists are inspired by other artists, but I've always felt that it was my responsibility to take that inspiration and, and create something with my own voice in, in my own painting. And so I hope in this painting, I was able to honor um, William Harnett's painting by, um, by uh, coming up with a new spin and a cowboy spin on kind of an, an old iconic um, composition. So, um, but anyway, but in conclusion to that, um, I, uh, I really love when I get to paint these, ty these old paintings, or these types of paintings, just because I get to sink my teeth into the, the different, um, uh, the research behind it and the textures and, and, um, and really the whole, the story. And I just love, love putting that story together. And sometimes the story um, comes quick and sometimes it takes years to develop. But when it all comes together, that's just, um, that's the... Uh, to me, that's, that's what it's all about. So um, anyway, I, I think this, this painting is honestly one that's going to be really hard to let go for me. So anyway, but, uh, but anyway, that's, that's my, uh, my talk and just how my idea comes together. But I would love to answer any questions for you guys. Um, there's some microphones um, if you guys want to go up and talk. But I can also, if you want to, if I can hear you, then you, and I can repeat it out. Uh-huh. Right? Is there the, story the old saddle. I'm trying to... Is this the oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an old working saddle that came off of, came off of the O'Connor Ranch down in Victoria, Texas, I think. I, I don't remember who the maker may have been. It may have been uh, Tiboletti Saddle, which a lot of the old saddles off of... Um, I, I, I borrowed that saddle, and it's been several years ago. But it had so... I remember what you're talking about. It had so much character that it had the saddlebags built into the to the, uh, the saddle, and um, it was just, it was a really cool piece, but it definitely came off one of the ranches down near Victoria, where I grew up in South Texas, so, yeah. So, um, any other questions about um, technique or, or um, anything else? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I only have like 516 questions for you, but... Well, go for it. Go for it. Do you sketch? 
Yes, I do a lot of sketches. In fact, I probably could have included some sketches in, my, uh, in this presentation, but I'll, I'll sit down when the idea is coming together, just like my stagecoach. Before it all was put together, I'm drawing and sketching. Oh, I need a, like the, the old hat box that was in the, um, let's see if I can go back to, like, for instance, that, um, that stagecoach piece. Like, just coming up with this, I'd already sketched that out a lot. And then once it was all put together and I've got that all composed, then I'll make sketches of my, of my, um, my setup here like that, so, mm -hmm. And then on like the, faint, pardon me, the final painting, uh, when you light your set, do you control the lighting that precisely? Oh, I, I, in fact, what I like to do is I spend a lot of time setting up and composing everything. And then once it's all set up, I'll take a lot of photographs and series of photographs just so that the lighting doesn't change. Because in this case, that, with that stagecoach piece, it was a daylight scene. And setting things up like this, the lighting's constantly changing. And there's so many little details that I try to lock all that stuff in through photographs. And what's nice, too, is I'll sit and paint a lot of times at a monitor to where I can bring those details in really close and zoom out and see the big picture as opposed to standing up, walking across the room, trying to look at things. And then I can pick up the old shotgun, for instance, and, and hold it in my hands and, and, and look at those details up close if I need to. But, but, um, but yeah, um, I got off the track, but you were asking about the lighting. And yeah, it's important to really kind of lock that in. Because I'm very, very, I, th I think lighting can, can uh, I, I have a tendency to kind of fall back on the similar kind of lighting cross light. And it really defines an artist's work a lot of times because a, a I think artists are sometimes drawn to that same, um, same lighting effect, I am at least. And so um, I can tell if, if a painting is, I could think, oh, that just doesn't look like my painting because it's lit differently. Uh, well, it's lit beautifully. And that's my last question. Mm -hmm. When you get around towards the end, does your detail brush have like one hair in it? <laughs> I've got, my brushes go through a lot of different phases. So I, um, I, they start out, and, and I, I just have a whole, um, I may need one that's gotten all bristly for painting the little hairs on a rope or something. And then I, um, I, I've got some that are more, if I need a clean edge. So they just go through phases. I never throw paint brushes away. They all just kind of get used. And then eventually, um, they just get worn down to a nub and then I end up having, I don't even like to throw them away at that point because I just, they, you're getting so attached to them at that point. But they just kind of evolve and become a, a little tool, you know, so, um, so anyway. But, uh, yes, sir. Oh, oh yeah, so what is my production time on a piece? Um, uh, let's see, um, can I get back to the slides again? Um, where, uh, yeah, there we go. Like on a piece like this, I mean, it was, that was a large painting. I mean, um, and so a piece like that, I've got more than a month in it a lot of times. And sometimes these, um, the, the, the actual idea takes so long just to, to develop that um, it, from the time that I actually start to gather the materials and set everything up, um, to the, which I'll spend sometimes as much as a week on the actual composition and setting it up and getting everything right. I mean, even, even the little, coming to the, just that little dangle of, of, um, of off the tarp there kind of hanging down, that just is all part of the, the, of the uh, I love anything that's torn and tattered, so I try to include that a lot of times. I want things to feel like they have, they've had a life before. And so I'm thinking about all that kind of stuff and, and um, so, so I, may, I may have a week into it at that point, and then the painting itself, um, sometimes as much as another three weeks to a month, but that's working pretty steadily, and I, sometimes I just kind of just work, 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 and then after I, the painting's done, then I might take a week off or something like that. But I like when I dive in, I just kind of go in deep. So and that's the same with my uh, researching this stuff too. Yes, sir. Hey, Kyle. I'm blown away by your work. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, I'm a writer myself, um, but I feel like perhaps all art is telling a story. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to know, how do you inspire yourself creatively? What's, what's your process for uh, getting over um, you know, creative exhaustion and uh, renewing that creativity? To me, it's stepping away from it. 
And, every, and when it comes to the ideas, you'll see me paint a painting like this, and I'll just go almost something completely different. And while I, I can't help but be inspired by different things I hear, I mean, we all are every day, I, um, whether it's songs I listen to or the things I see, and I try to surround myself with, with um, I'm kind of a, a, just by nature, a collector of stuff, and I'm always looking for um, new and interesting projects to work on. And, um, and so anytime I come across something like that, it just sparks a little idea in my mind. And as I'm painting these paintings, I'm thinking ahead a little bit, thinking what, what could be the next idea? But once I get to that place and I feel like I'm in that rut a little bit and I can't quite um, come up with a new idea, I find that if I just step away and uh, maybe go fishing or something like that, then, <laughs> then I just all of a sudden a whole new, a new avenue opens up. But I do realize I try to take breaks from uh, particular subjects that I'm painting. For instance, I might do a cowboy painting, then the next thing I might paint is maybe um, like an old Indian shield or a war bonnet or something like that, and, and then I may be, maybe bounce back to like a cowboy um, painting or something. And it just kind of keeps, keeps things feeling fresh for me, and I can just kind of step back and, and give some air to where I'm not feeling like I'm too pressured. And that, that always kind of brings that creativity back to me and creates a spark. Mm -hmm. Cal, you mentioned that sometimes you have the idea but not the objects, mm -hmm. and then other times you have the objects but trying to figure out the idea. Right. A few years ago, you did a, uh, <clears throat> a large war bonnet or headdress, mm -hmm. and am I right? Did you, did you make that headdress? Yeah. In fact, I, so I, anytime I can have the excuse to actually make something, I'm going to do it because I, I just like working with my hands and building things and crafting things. Um, it makes me more in touch with the subjects that I paint. And, um, and yeah, so a lot of that, I, I mean, I, I, I've had access to some original war bonnets before, but sometimes the, the brow band may just not quite look the way I mix. I, what happens, let me step back. I'll get an idea for, for, I'll see something in my mind. Maybe I see a photograph in a book, or maybe it's locked away in a museum somewhere to where I can't access it. And, and that, that idea, it's just like that photo, that fiddle player. I, I was thinking, man, I got to have that photo. But, but it, sometimes it, it works out to where you, it makes you think outside the box. And I found that in more of an inspirational type of a photo as opposed to the literal photo of the fiddle player. But the, um, with the war bonnet, for instance, I get locked in on an idea and then I can't always put my hands on the exact thing that I need. So in that case, I'll, I'll actually craft something or, or I'll take a little bit of artistic license to help me fit it into my original vision so that when it just better matches what, I'm, what I was trying to, to paint in the first place as they're trying to force something in to make it work. So, um, so making that war bonnet, First, I just wanted to make a war bonnet. I thought it would be really cool. And then at the same time, so I, so I got, a, I, I couldn't get a hold of actual eagle feathers, obviously. So I, I got some turkey feathers that were pretty close, and, and I learned how to stain them to where they looked really authentic and um, basically put it all together. And I, I spent some time making it, but now it's cool. I've got this war bonnet that I put together that I was able to use. And I've, and I've deconstructed it a little bit and changed some things and made another one for another painting once before. So, um, but Yeah. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So she asked if I, if I have multiple paintings basically going at once. And usually it's one painting at a time for me. I like to just focus on it. I go so deep into what it is that I'm, that I'm actually, uh, let's see here. Oh, wait. Yeah. So anyway, I go so uh, deep down into that. I, I like to just focus on it until it's, it's done. I've always felt like, you know, once I got my sights on the top of the mountain, I just want to not get distracted and do what it takes to get to the top. And once I'm there, then bask a little bit and then move on to the next mountain, you know. That's how it feels for me. Yes, sir. To still life? <laughs> it's a funny story. So... I, um, yeah, so what drove me to still life painting? So I used to, I lived, I grew up on the Texas coast and I've always been drawn to the, the you know, down there with the, um, I grew up fishing and just being outdoors and, 
And plus my grandfather was a cowboy, so I just kind of grew up around a bunch of all old saddles and things like that and being outside. And I always liked landscapes. And I was doing a lot of coastal scenes. In fact, my very first gallery that I ever, I, in fact, with me fishing, I did a lot of uh, more fishing scenes, the guys out on a, a wading the flats and fishing for redfish and things. And then, I, I, so I had taken my work to a gallery in Port Aransas, Texas, which is just a little, you, some of you guys have probably been, a little beach town. And they had a gallery there that um, started selling my artwork. And, and um, so I, I sold, sold some landscapes, did old shrimp boat paintings and things like that. And then uh, my wife, Lee, um, she... Uh, um, we, w- we actually went up to Michigan to, where she went to school in Michigan State to, become a C- uh, to get her, her CPA. And so we moved up there and, and um, you know, I, I took all my photographs and I was up there and I was painting shrimp boats and fishing scenes and sending them back down to, to and I, I was doing these Texas landscapes and sending them all back down to my gallery. And then at some point I started kind of running out of ideas. My photographs were getting a little stale. And then, um, like I said, my grandfather was a cowboy. So he had all these saddles and spurs and the things laying around. And I I called him up and I was like, hey, you know, hey, Pap, send me that stuff you got. And um, some of those, some of those old pieces. So he sent me some, like uh, some old um, spurs and whatnot, boots and things. And um, I'd been so close to that stuff that I didn't really, I appreciate it. I thought it was cool, but I hadn't thought about including it in a painting. I think I was just a little too close to it at the time. So I, I started doing these paintings of still life. So I had done a little bit of still life in school and college, but um, I liked the, the, the looking out and seeing things, you know, the big landscape paintings. But then once I started doing those still life paintings and I got, I, I, um, I I, like I said, uh, I think it was introduced. I, I studied with an artist by the name of Dalhart Winberg, and he would paint these very detailed um, paintings, and he would do still life and landscape. But I remember being drawn to um, a painting that he did. It was an old, um, like an old uh, brandy snifter glass, and you could actually, he, he did this, it was the brandy glass and this rose, and, and in the glass you could see his reflection, and I always thought that was so cool. So I, I started getting into the details of all the still, all the things, and, that, and painting the, the subject that um, some of my old grandpa's, or some of my grandfather's old, old pieces really kind of sparked that, that interest in the, the cowboy subject matter. And, um, and once I started doing that, I just realized, I think what happened was um, I kind of carved out a little bit of a niche um, in the still life um, genre, and, and that's just what I became comfortable painting. And, and now it's kind of, it's kind of what I do. I, I think sometimes about painting landscapes again, but I've gotten so far removed from it that now still lifes are kind of what I'm known for and what I do. So um, who knows? I, every now and then I'll do something, I'll do a sketch and I'll work it in like I did, like I did a fo- the photo in my, my fiddle painting. Um, but uh, anyway, another thing I didn't mention, just bringing up the fiddle painting again, I think it's really, um, really uh, cool that... Um, that, you know, I go down these uh, rabbit holes of trying to, yeah, I get all these little ideas floating around in my mind of um, kind of, inter- you know, that's the fun part for me is you got all these little details and interests. And another, another cool thing, can, um, can you, yeah, the fiddle painting. I, I think what was cool about that is, um, a thing I forgot to mention is that the, um, the all, you know, when you look at the cowboys um, and, and the way of life, I mean, that you think of the culture that emerged out there on the, on the range. You know, we've got all these guys from different walks of life. Everybody's bringing their culture, and it's this melting pot. And after learning more about the, the, the poetry aspect to all this, um, it's the roots of American music, you know. And so I just think that kind of stuff is so cool, and, and um, I just get into learning about that kind of stuff as I'm painting. And um, it's just fun when I can somehow incorporate that into the the spirit of the paintings that I'm doing, so, yeah. I have a question. Uh-huh. Um, first of all, the first time my husband and I saw your work was at the Autry Show, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, um, and I had seen a lot of um, le- uh, still life before. I don't know if you remember K.M. Hendricks. I, yeah, I've heard yeah. the name. Uh-huh. And he put the violin in his a lot. Yeah, you know, a violin, okay. and it showed up every third Sure, painting. sure. <laughs> but um, we were impressed with how, how much of a buzz there was around your work at, mm-hmm. at the Autry. And I looked at it, and I thought, now, why is this still life guy, you know, uh, rising to the top all of a sudden? And everybody, and I noticed how much effort you put into your frames and your oh, presentation. Yeah. So I wonder if that was a real conscious effort on your part to make those pieces stand out. Oh, sure. I think the frame, the frame around a painting is really important. I, I put a lot of time into 
trying to pick the right frame. I've got a couple of different framers that I work with, but, um, but I always try to, to make the frame become a part of the painting itself. And, and also you'll notice a lot of times I'll, I'll float the, the which, it, which you see that a lot of times in more modern art, but I, liked, um, I like to, to leave a little bit of a float around the canvas. So the frame isn't actually touching the canvas itself. And there's two reasons for that personally. I think the I, I can frame them wet, <laughs> which is good, but at the same time, they, uh, so if I'm up against a deadline, it's pretty easy to pop into frame. But anyway, I think it, it just, there's something about being able to see the edge of the canvas and the entire painting that just, and it kind of stands out as an original piece. I don't know. I think that's kind of cool. So, um, yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, I mean that's always tough because I'm at the, I'm just at this place where um, where I've got to pay the bills, you know. And I but I, I want I want to be able to keep some of these paintings aside. I've, my wife and I have two girls, Kate and Taylor, um, and I really want to leave something for them. And I'm just I, I've I've. I'm trying to step back a little now and maybe paint some more for myself. But but when I do a painting, especially like the the fiddle painting here, I um, I, uh, I I always see it. It's all, you get attached to these things, and it's really tough to let them go. And you know that they're going to be out there, and sometimes they disappear into a collection and you never see them again. And then at other times they kind of pop back out, and it's always fun to go back and revisit them when you can. I love to look at my paintings that I haven't seen in a long time and, and get up close to them and. And just remember that, you know, it's, you get, like I said, I, I work really close to my canvas. So you get, you get up, you get really, um, really attached to them for sure. Yeah. Um, I keep thinking of things I, I left out in my talk. But another thing that was kind of interesting, another little tidbit of information is, uh, so I always wonder what's the difference between a fiddle and a violin. But it's not. It's, there's no difference. It's the way it's played. It's the type of music. So if you're playing bluegrass or folk music, you're playing a fiddle. It's a style. If you're playing classical, you're playing a violin, you know. And so in this paint, in my, in my fiddle painting, again, the, uh, the, another thing you see a lot of times is the rosin dust that's collected on the fiddle, especially one that's been played a lot. And so I wanted to be sure and include that too. Um, and you can see that in there. And that was one more thing that my friend Ross pointed out to me, you know. So I, it's all those little details that are just so fun when they come together. And I, I just, I, it, it, what's real fun a lot of times for me is, for instance, um, I, I, don't, I don't think it was this shotgun didn't have it, but I had done another old shotgun, and I really got into it, and I was looking at it, and it had, um, it had you know, the, the details on it, and I painted it. And a, a friend of mine who uh, lives, lives down the street from me came over one day, and he's, he's not an art collector. He's not into, not, doesn't really, uh, cons- he's just not, not into art so much. And he walked up to my painting, and he's like, oh my gosh, that shotgun, that's Damascus steel and all this stuff. And, I was, and the fact that he recognized the type of steel and the way the barrel was made, that I love when that happens because I, I had looked into all that stuff and I knew about it and I put it in my painting, but not everybody sees that. So when somebody who just from the, can walk up and, and look at something like that, that you've done and appreciate those little details, that's who I want to paint for. You know, the majority of people may not see it, but to me, I know it's there. It's those little those little things kind of, um, I love when I can, and then when somebody recognizes it, that's what's really fun, so. Hello, Kyle. Hi. Have you ever been to North Dakota, and uh, have you ever done any Native American subjects or planning to, and are you a lefty or a righty? Oh, I'm a righty. Yeah. So, um, and um, it's interesting, my, my daughter, 14, she's an artist, and she's a lefty, so it's, it's just funny you ask that question, but... Uh, but Anyway, no, I, I love painting Native American subject matter. In fact, the, um, mostly, like I said, the, the actual um, items are just so intriguing to me. And when I can learn about the symbolism and the meaning behind some of that stuff, it's just one more rabbit hole that I can go down and, and just learn because I get so involved in, in the, the, the research part of it. And, and on top of that, I've got a few friends. My, a friend of mine, Daniel Long Soldier, uh, calls me a lot of times. We, we visit on the phone, and, and he grew up on the Pine Ridge Reservation, and he does some really amazing ledger drawings. Um, and he'll, he'll tell me those nuances and details, and, and I can ask him, you know, what, what do you think this, uh, is this, you know, this war bond? He's like, oh, that's probably uh, Cheyenne, or that's, that's Blackfoot, you know, or something. And, and I can, we can talk about it, and I can ask those questions and learn. Because I try to learn as much as I can before I try to paint something. And then I want to honor the things that I paint. I, I want to Feel, and I'm, I'm, I can't know everything. I can't learn it all. So I always want to take it to as far as I can go and, and, and get all those things right so that 
a, a professional fiddle player can look at the, the painting and go, oh, wow, you did your homework. You knew what you were doing. This guy who did it right, you know? Because otherwise, to me, I'd be kicking myself all the time going, darn, I missed that, you know, and, and want to get it back and fix it somehow. So I try to think of all those things before I even start, like the whole composition of the painting, try to just get all that stuff dialed in so there's no more, no more questioning at that point and then I can get started painting it, so. Mm-hmm. Sometimes I'm really, it's, I'm really lucky. I've made some, I, I'm, she asked if, if I get to see where my paintings wind up sometimes. And, oh yeah, I mean, I love whenever, it's, it's, I think what's really cool is when certain paintings wind up with certain people and you're so glad that, that it made it into that collection or that they have it. It's funny how that happens. I mean, it's almost like um, when, when uh, you know, it's just interesting how pieces uh, sometimes go to the right people, you know, and and but but I've made some amazing friends in the in the whole um, the, this whole journey, and and I've gotten invited to back to their homes to see the paintings, and um, that's always so much fun. And uh, and then sometimes sometimes you you even forget about the paintings you did, and then you come back you come back and oh somebody oh, I've got several of your paintings. You go back and you're thinking wow I forgot I even did that, and then, so it's like revisiting an old friend that you hadn't seen in so long, you know. <laughs> no, I, do I do I ever care about? Do I ever have feelings about not uh, how it's how it's displayed in their homes? Um, no, I think I think I've realized collectors are pretty savvy, especially when you're purchasing art that is so meaningful to you. You um, you display it, um, you cherish it. So I think that I I've always been. Um, I've always been, you know, the pieces that I've come across of mine that I've been invited into homes to see, I've always been very happy with the way it's displayed. I think lighting is really important for a painting. And, um, and especially my pieces, they can, I, I, I paint these kind of very encapsulated scenes and I like that chiaroscuro dark light. So I, I, I think a good strong light on my piece is, is always important because I really want to be able to uh, let those contrast really or the, the, some of the nuances, you, you miss them if you don't have really good light on them. So I think that's important, but, but yeah. Oh, yes, sir. You touched briefly on using technology and zooming in yeah. with the camera. Can you say more about that? And does that affect your, uh, the perspective on what you're looking I've, at? I've got to be, so I've got to be very aware of that because I do incorporate that, the, the camera. I photograph things whenever I, when I set it up but I, I have to make sure I'm on the right focal length to where, I, I, I'll be honest, I'll tell you a story. When I was really, uh, when I was young, first starting out, I, I had painted this, um, this old, there was a, I had done this landscape and there was a, uh, there was a, like a hillside and an old road. And I found this old, like a, I think it was like an old model T Ford pickup truck or something in the farmer. And there's an old dog in the back of the truck, you know, and I, I wanted to put this scene together and, I was, I was pretty inexperienced, so I, I, was, I was laying it all out, and I, had, I actually I built a model of this old truck, you know, because it was just a little, little square model of the truck, and I wanted to incorporate it into the, into the scene. So I actually set it up like a diorama, and I got down low, and I photographed it, you know, and then I, I made it all, and I had the, had the photograph that I wanted, and the, and the little model was lit right, and I painted it in the scene, and I go back to my mentor, uh, Dal Hart Winberg, and I show him this painting. I'm so proud of it, and he said, Oh, wow. He said, yeah, it's a really, really neat painting. It was kind of a spinoff of one of his paintings. And he said, but you got one problem. He goes, how long is that truck? Because it's probably about 50 feet long because the front tire was this big and the back tire was this big because I had, I had photographed it with the wrong focal length. And so the camera stretched it out to where it felt like the car was. And so, you know, when you try to looked at it with my eye and seen that and painted it from you know, from looking at it, I wouldn't have, I would have, I wouldn't have, the camera plays tricks on you. So you have to be very aware of that kind of stuff. But, um, but I think, you know, I just use it as a tool, especially to, to help me in that sense where a, a big, a big composition, photographing it like that, um, locking it in, I've got to be mindful of all those kind of things. And I, and like I said, the camera lies. So um, anybody that, that uses a camera knows that. So I've learned that over the years. Carl, I know you love the ocean, and I know you sail a lot. You ever thought of going back and doing some of these uh, old paintings that uh, you were talking about, about the <laughs> scenes? Honestly, I, I think about it at times, but 
I'm a hobby guy. So I love, to, I love doing these things. There's always new things I'm excited about. I like to fly fish. I like to sail. I like to, um, uh, I'm drawing a blank. There's lots of things. I, I just started beekeeping, you know, things like that. And so, so I, painting was one that stuck early on. And so I just, I feel like I've moved beyond that. But the, as much as I love painting and as much as it's part of my life and what I do, the, the idea of embarking on a new journey into painting right now, I've got other, other hobbies I want to do, you know? And so, but I'll keep painting and I want to paint and I love what I do and I feel like I've gotten to where when it, what I, the, the paintings that I'm painting, I can almost, um, it's easy for me now to get into that flow state. As much as you're constantly tweaking and, and thinking of these things, it's become a point to where now as I'm doing it, I can almost relax and daydream about these other things I want to be doing, you know? So, and, and right now, going back and revisiting these, um, these uh, the, uh, doing landscapes again, it seems a little daunting, you know, honestly. So, but anything else? Oh. It, it, how proactive I am as far as my output goes? Or? Oh, okay, I got gotcha. you. Oh, yeah. Sure. Oh, yeah, let's do it. Yeah. Let's see here. Yep, let's go to this one. Oh, yeah, I go go to the, front, the first picture here. There you go. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Well, honestly, if I could lift that little, uh, the, if I could get in the shadow, it actually says Butterfields. <laughs> so you missed it. You missed it by one letter. So anyway, <laughs> but no, as far as how how um, how far out I think I. I these, sometimes these, it depends on the eye objects, like that old violin. I probably had that in my barn for probably at least six or seven years, just sitting up there. And I had painted it once before. I did like this uh, painting of an old, um, more, I was thinking more kind of along the lines of like an old mountain man fiddle, kind of a, a jub ju uh, jubilee kind of an idea with the old uh, trapper blanket and that kind of thing. So, but I, but I had been saving it up because I had, had been really wanting to paint it again. And that, I sat on that idea for a long time. But I'm, I'm usually thinking ahead at least, at least six months to a year out, especially if I've got a show um, coming up. There's um, the pieces I'm working on at home right now are for a show in Santa Fe with Legacy Gallery. Um, and so I've, got to, I've, I've constantly got to be thinking ahead to, about those ideas. But I've, have, I've got faith that those ideas are going to come. Um, and I just... Um, and, and there's, I, I don't, I, I try not to go back and revisit things I've painted too much because I, it stays fresh for me if I can um, step away from, and once I paint it, I, I'm, I'm interested in moving on to something different. But there's, there's always those other ideas that I can kind of go back and think, rethink a little bit, and maybe I want to try this and try that. So it's easy to tap back into that, but I'm always trying to look ahead to see um, new and exciting ideas to, to try to tackle, especially in the Western art genre, just because that's, that's where I, I'm, the, to me, that's where all those textures are. I feel like I've got roots there. Um, it's the stuff that really speaks to me. But, um, but there's, there's a, especially when it comes to the old nostalgic objects like that, it's, it's hard to get more nostalgic than, than the, you know, the, the Western cowboy stuff. But, um, but there's, you know, anytime I go to an antique store, I'm always just got my eyes out for something really cool that, that's going to catch my attention. So, mm hmm Do you ever sell your sketches or do you sell? Honestly, the, do I sell my sketches? I, they're pretty rudimentary. I work things up, and then when it comes down to time to actually sketch to go onto the canvas, it's, I just am going, concentrating on making a line drawing. I'm not doing a lot of shading and stuff. And I'm, not, I'm working things out pretty rudimentary in, in shapes and things. And then once, I, once I've got this set up like that, then I, I've, got, I've, I've got the, the, the objects the way I want them. 
Um, and then, then at that point, my drawing is, is very um, rudimentary line drawings, and, and then I'm working in those, the, the detail. Um, but I, a lot of that I'm working out with the brush. It's mostly on the canvas. I'm trying to get those major shapes in the right place and get the proportions together. In fact, um, I got to tell you one more story. Um, talking about drawing, it's, just, uh, it's so important. I, I had the opportunity to uh, meet Willie Nelson, and, and I painted Trigger, his famous, uh, his famous guitar, once. And, um, and I had started the painting and, I, and the, the, I'd, I'd already gotten the, the neck of the guitar worked on and, and my wife was out of town. She had left and, and she came back and she looked at the painting and she's like, I think it's a little crooked. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I, I look and I start doing my, get my calipers out and I'm looking, I'm like, oh. So if I don't get that drawing right, especially when it comes to the detail level that I'm painting, I mean, that's, that's, that's super important. So, um, so after I had to basically scrap it and I restarted the painting again because I just didn't have my drawing right. And I tried to get all that stuff ironed out before I even, the brush hits the canvas. But it's hard. My technique doesn't necessarily lend itself to, um, to uh, I, I paint pretty thin. I let a lot of the, the canvas, I, my, um, some of my paints are more translucent. So it's not like I can just go back and cover up a mistake. I usually, um, once I've started and I make sure all my drawing is correct on the canvas before I, start actually tackling the painting part. And I try my best not to let those kind of things happen. So, but as far as my sketches go, I don't, I don't usually sell my sketches, but. How, how long did you have access to trigger? Uh, it was pretty, well, honestly, it was, it was interesting. I, so I went, um, I met Connie Nelson um, through a friend, Connie Nelson's Willie's ex-wife and she, um, she introduced me to Willie's band manager who had Trigger at his house. I don't even think Trigger stays with Willie all the time. But um, anyway, he had, um, they were about to go on, a, it was around Willie's 80th birthday, I think. And so they were about to go on tour for something. But I went to John Selman's house, who who's Will, at the time was Willie's band manager. And um, Paul English was there. And this is before Paul had died. And I got to visit with Paul and stuff. But um, and so they, he goes back and gets the guitar, his band manager, he's just strumming away on it. And he's like, here you go. And I'm just like, whoa, man, this is, this is, he didn't, he wouldn't, they weren't letting me borrow it. I, I had to photograph it. And then I had another Martin guitar that I was able to use to stand in. And then that, that, the, that he has a little pickup on the bridge that was, that was modified that he, that he actually, it's pretty, like, you, it's the whole bridge is just set up on the trigger is, is unique. So I had to actually fabricate that on my guitar so that I could get the lighting right and everything. And I was able to find the exact pickup that he had on his guitar and all that to put it together. But I took a series of photos with all close-ups of the signatures and all that kind of stuff. But I was able to go out there for an afternoon and kind of hang out and take pictures. And then after the painting was all done, I went to Willie's Ranch and he came out and he signed the, signed the painting before I varnished it and everything. And we got to visit for just a little bit. And I got a picture and stuff, but... Um, Willie was a little inebriated when I saw him. <laughs> but he was, so, oh, he's such a nice guy. So fun. But he had his sunglasses on and everything, you know. <laughs> but uh, anyway, it was fun. He was Willie, you know. Who, who, you, know you, you know what you, I oh, will, but anyway, that was fun. No, I, I'm trying to think who bought that. I, who bought that? I sold that painting um, in, in uh, Dallas. Um, we actually, part of the proceeds for the painting, we, we donated to Farm Aid and some stuff like that. But I haven't seen that painting. And um, I'm, I'm not even sure who has it now, but I haven't seen it come up for resale. But uh, that was one of those that was a notch in my belt, you know, because it was just a fun painting to do. In fact, I kind of made that happen because I really thought it was kind of, would be kind of fun because I thought, man, what would be a more fun subject of matter to paint than Willie's guitar, you know? So I reached out to a buddy who knew a friend, who knew another friend and put me in touch with Connie and she's so sweet. And she was like, oh, Willie, he would totally let you do that. And I'm like, wow, that's great. So it, sure enough, it happened and it all came together and it was fun, so, yep. Well, thank you guys. Yeah.